Hello, welcome to the 35th episode of Nothing Serious at Night. This afternoon, I'm joined by a new guest who helps me to review the debacle of a movie called Never Say Never Again. And I guess you can tell what my opinion is. It's, I'm going to say it's the worst James Bond movie, but I think that the one that came out... Oh, and there we go. And see, I always manage to find a way to screw up the introduction. I've had playback there. It, the last episode was the only one, so one out of 35 for not screwing them up ain't bad. So, our new guest today discussing this travesty of a James Bond movie from 1983 that has Sean Connery playing James Bond in a remake of Thunderball, which he was also in. But I digress. We'll talk about that a little more. Yeah, we're joined by our new guest who's shaking his head and laughing at how ridiculous this movie is. Uncle Herb, do you want to say hello? Uh, thanks, Max. I appreciate being on today. Thank you very much. Oh, it's 100% my pleasure, Uncle Herb. 100% my pleasure indeed. So we are talking about Never Say Never Again. And the premise is that uh, Spectre, the evil organization from all the James Bond movies, steals two nuclear weapons, and they decide to put one underneath the White House. I guess they told people it was near the president, so they kind of gave that one away. This movie's pretty bad. They said it's right underneath the president's feet, which, you know, they, they give that away in their phone call. It's something you don't do if you're an evil terrorist organization. And they have one that's kind of a mystery box, and it's hidden in... James Bond is much older. He's 53 years old. It was made in 1983. And I think it's a solid movie for the first 30 minutes or so, but then it gets really, really, really weird. Would you say that's accurate? Or I'd say around the 23-minute the mark. 23-minute um, mark? Yeah, that's, that's, that's where I called it last night. <laughs> what was the weirdest thing for you? Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's crazy. I'd say, the, actually, yeah, the weirdest part... Um, was whenever the, uh, the the antagonist female Fatima Blush. Fatima, yes, uh, she uh, mercilessly beat the hell <laughs> of this Air Force pilot. Yeah, yeah she he, she catches him smoking, and she's saying, uh, "Baby is gonna need, will get his medicine and stuff like that." And over the heroin they got him addicted to, then he tries to choke her because she threatens his sister, and then she beats him up and slams his head into the wall. And you know, James Bond. This is one of the plots of. Uh, this is the plot of Thunderballs. James Bond is like at a health spa after um, after doing some spy stuff. I mean, they're both different movies, but they're both. This is the bad writing in both of them. He's at a health spa, and there just happens to be evil an evil uh, bad bad guy at pulling in the process of pulling off their plot at the health spa. The original Thunderball was a lot better, but there's some you know I think there's some good stuff. Like there's this plot line with Bond. He's older. Um, MI6 doesn't really like the double O program anymore. They have him teaching. He's kind of rusty. They have a pretty good opening sequence, I think, where he's going through Central America taking out bad guys, but then you find out it's a training simulation. He gets chewed out, so they send him to that health spa to get better. And I think he has some funny lines in it, too. Like, there, the, the, this uh, nurse asks Bond mm -hmm. for a urine sample, and she's across the room. He's like, from over here? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the one good thing about this movie is that Connery has all sorts of good one-liners. I would say, um, I think that that that's one thing is the first thirty minutes of the movie is him basically being very op oppositional to the new management of MI6 that doesn't seem to believe in the mission of the Double O section. The new uh, M played by Edward Fox is clearly at least fifteen to twenty years his junior and doesn't quite care for him and reprimands him for getting chewed out and he the one of my favorite one lines he's like he's like your body has too many free radicals in it 007 you've been eating too much red meat drinking too many martinis and white bread then connery's bond goes i shall cut out the white bread then <laughs> that, that, was a, that was a quintessential joke right there uh he I don't, I don't even know how to explain it. It's like I'm just at a loss of words at this moment. So, <laughs> it's it was, such a it, strange movie. His, it was it was such a strange movie, and it just really brought towards uh, the light. You see, uh, was it, this brought back Sean Connery from the brink of, uh, well, I wouldn't say on the brink of. Uh, well, he made Zarda, so he was in some bad career shape. So playing James Bond in an unofficial James Bond movie, and there's a whole lawsuit that's the story behind that. So look into the Kevin McClory, Ian Fleming lawsuit, yeah. and that's how you find out if this bastardization of a James Bond movie got made. So it doesn't even have the 007 music in it, it doesn't have the gun barrel sequence. 
It has, I think, I think an okay opening theme, but instead of having an opening theme with, like, girls dancing around and stuff, it's actually Bond doing the mission. You didn't like the theme to Never Say Never Again by Lonnie Hall, did you? No, no. I, I didn't. But, it, but look, the only thing that really was James Bond-esque at the beginning of it was, uh, it's like the old coding, like 0101, what it was zero, all. Zero, seven, yeah, yeah. Zero, zero, 007. Zero, zero, seven. And it's... I'm, I'm not going to lie, I was, uh, was kind of hoping to see some uh, sushi recipes in Japanese there, you know? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> the, the opening to the Matrix, you know? The oh, okay, got it. All, yeah. Oh, geez, yeah. yeah, it does look like the opening to the Matrix. So, the basic plot is that Spectre steals some nukes and decides to hold the world hostage because they're going to blow some shit up. And I know that's a lot of James Bond movies, you just only change them so much. And uh, I'm seeing Oleander Rainbow saying, I've never even heard of Never Seen Ever Again. It's probably a good thing, and I say this as someone who pays attention to the James Bond theme songs. I like the theme, but yeah, it's not that good. And hi, Chad. Thank you for showing up, and thank you for everybody else who's uh, showing up today. Um, I, I would say one of the worst things about this movie, aside from maybe the opening sequence and the fight he has with Pat Roach of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark fame, <laughs> is that, wouldn't you say that the action in this movie is terrible? Like, he has a motorcycle chase, and just, like, nothing happens. It's, like, kind of low speed. He Like, they make a motorcycle going over, jumping over cars look boring. Isn't that one of the horrors of this movie? Yes. Yes. But, though, get, to get back to the fight scene we were just talking about. Oh, the fight scene with Pat Roach? Yes. That, that's actually kind of funny. <laughs> it's, it's the way that they, they ended the fight. Yes. But if, if you notice, yes. very so lightly, you'd see his... Uh, you could see his two face slowly coming up. Every oh, Connery's? Time. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Connery was, Connery has always been bald and wearing a piece, even in the first James Bond movie. But, yeah, he's very clearly, at least in Herb's opinion, wearing a much more obvious piece. But he has that fight scene when Spectre realizes that Bond is in the same health spot as them as maybe picked up on what their evil plan is to put a retinal implant in an American Air Force guy and steal nukes. I know, it's... It's uh, the president's eye. Yeah, they somehow got the president's retinal uh, retinal eye so they can do a retinal scan and they steal some nuclear weapons. It's kind of like Dr. Strangelove meets 24 meets a really bad made-for-TV movie. I think that's a way to describe the plot. Would you say so, Herb? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Uncle Herb uh, is shaking his head in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Zardoz isn't a perfect movie, Oleander is saying, it, but it's so bizarre. The gun is good, but the penis is evil. An actual quote from the movie, yes. Yeah, so he has a fight with Pat Roach, if any of you guys remember right over so The Lost Ark, or if you don't, I'll remind you. He's the big German guy that Indiana Jones fights in the desert and kills him with a propeller. So he has a fight scene with Connery, and Connery's trying to do everything he can to him. He even, like, punches him in the stomach with a barbell, and it doesn't hurt him. And throughout the fight, he's actually able to start hurting him, so there's some inconsistencies, which I think the inconsistencies I'm pointing are the least of this movie's problems. But, you know, they, they go through the... It is kind of a fun scene where Connery is brawling with Pat Roach and running through this health, health facility and just throwing things at him and trying to outwit him. And eventually they're in a lab where they keep all the specimens. And... Remember the urine sample that I mes mentioned earlier that Herb told you, Uncle Herb told us about? So Connery, or well it is, Con Connery and Bonnard are the same in my mind a little bit. And Connery grabs this like jar and throws the fluids into Pat Roach's face. Then Pat Roach goes flying backwards or stumbling backwards. And then he hits, he crashes into something. He falls to his knees and he hits the ground. You see all these shards of glass in his back. So he's finally killed him. Hitting him with barbells doesn't work. Backing up into some glass does work. Yes, yeah, so this I think you left a key a key uh, key note to that out. Oh, oh I'm getting I'm getting okay, to it. Okay. So he looks at what the specimen was that he threw in the guy's face, and it was his urine sample from earlier. So this is the first movie where Bond has used a. This is the only James Bond movie I know of where he's killed somebody using a bodily function. Are there any other ones you can think of? No, no. That that was that was his pure excrement. And what I was gonna say, what you left out. I oh, left. No, go ahead. Uh, whenever he throws the urine in yeah. or the the fluid in yes. his face, I was thinking it was gonna be acid. The way he was holding his face and screaming. <laughs> you hear the, the the slight hits of. But just come to find out, it was Sean, Sean Connery's piss. So. Well, may, well, 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 maybe Bond had a little too much coffee that morning. And he cut the was... white bread out. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's the thing, is the entire facility gets destroyed. And that's one of the things that does work about this movie, is after he destroys the facility brawling with this guy, he gets chewed out by the new M. And the new M kind of, I, you know, I hate him when I was younger, but he kind of works because he reminds me of today's politically in politically correct bureaucrat he chews out bond for destroying the whole health facility he's like oh it's probably the husband of some woman you tried to bet and it's like yeah some like six foot two assassin shows up 
who gets gets doesn't get hurt by punches with barbells. He has weapons with him. But some guy who Bond tried to shag his wife. That's exactly what happened. He's like he's like a good portion of my meager budget has been eaten up, suppressing the news story and doing the repairs or something like that. And Bond, I like what Bond says. He's he's like yes, but I lost four pounds and I eliminated. God knows how many free radicals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, so what did you think? Do you want to talk about Fatima Blush? What did you, Fatima Blush is kind of the Bond villain slash Bond girl of this movie. Which, I mean, you got you to gotta think, like... Um, what was it? Pierce Brosnan won the... the, what, the one that Gold, has, Goldeneye. No, 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 no. The... Uh, Oh my goodness! I, I can't, I'm sorry. Tomorrow never dies. Yes, with the, the reincarnation stories in it, has Holly Berry with them. Oh no, that's Die Another Day. Die Another Day. So you have to forgive me. I've 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 kind of been out of the movie uh, yeah. spiel for a while, but uh, yeah, no. Um, you know, I mean, you have these characters showing up here and there for different bonds. Like I haven't seen yeah. one for Daniel Craig, obviously. Yeah. But, uh, um, she is a. Uh, I really, I really can't put a finger on it, man. She's 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 feisty, she's sophisticated, and I, to be honest, I really feel like she was put more in this movie to um, actually just beat this shit out of men. Does that you know? Pardon <laughs> yeah. my language, people. I'm uh... worse has been said on this show. You're okay, <laughs> Uncle Herb. <laughs> uh, I feel like she's just she's just been put there to put men in their place because uh, that's around this whole time. That's that's the whole uh, time where. Everybody's like, oh, well, Sean Connery's a uh, misogynistic uh, uh, rug wearer, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I think I think they did a good good point in adding her to the story. Or at least her uh, the actress that played her did a good job, at yeah. least for that part. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like, I, they don't give her much to do, but when they do give her stuff to do, it's kind of funny. She's kind of the predecessor of Xenia on a top in Goldeneye, I think. Or I think she's the prototype for her she's incredibly deadly she's kind of a of a nympho and especially that mommy will give you your treat yeah yeah when, when, when she's offering the u.s officer who they had deliberately hooked on arrow heroin stuff she's like she's like baby gets his candy like she says in that <laughs> weird like italian accent or something i think barbara i think her name is barbara carrera so i think she's italian or or maybe from spain but it I should call the accent weird but this is a somewhat politically incorrect show so i apologize for that or I don't. Fuck you. Anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if I think you should get fucked later on. Uh, oh well, that, that didn't sound good. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I do like how she has a creative way of killing the Air Force officer after they steal the nukes. She just like drives by him. She waves to him while he's in his car. He's he's like flirting with her, and then she just throws a boa constrictor in his car, and then it. Herb's shaking his head. Yeah, Herb, again. You have an on that. Again. Yes. No. It's. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was freaking out. Yeah, you know, as, as an American Air Force pilot, that you know, you're just, just saying they're yeah. supposed to be trained in like uh, you know the seer school type scenario. So yeah, you you're should, a military man. You you're were a man. No. You're you're a man, especially in the seventies or eighties. Yeah, eighties. Yeah. yeah, so eighties, you're you're a man in the U.S. military, and you're scared of a of a of a non venomous snake. Yeah, he should know that better. He should know better, and that's that's yeah, that was the one of the goofier aspects that I laughed at. Yeah, you left a lot of things that were goofy in this movie, and that's the thing, too, is uh, you should have known better. That's what uh, Kevin McClory should have been told. I hope somebody told him that after he tried to remake Thunderball and have Sean Connery in it. So Sean Connery famously had a falling out with producers of the Bond franchise and had been helping them to, to develop this movie. It's a complex plagiarism case, so the winners of the lawsuit or the settlement were allowed to remake Thunderball, but on, only Thunderball. So if you want to see a really bad Bond, James Bond, the, the sitcom... That's kind of what this movie is. Oh, that or that or if you're into very cringy Bond movies, this is the perfect, perfect movie for you. Yeah, it's more cringe than No Time to Die, I would say. Well, the third act of No Time to Die, I, I like the first two acts, but it, yeah, it's, it, it's out there with how fucking weird it is. It has a really, really weird soundtrack. Some of it sounds like generic Bond fare. And hello, Dagger, thank you for showing up. And, but it has... A really strange jazzy soundtrack there uh, so i think taylor pointed it out on twitter and brought it back to you know to the forefront of my mind he's been on the show a few times he's a bond fan he said oh bond finds a fellow co-worker oh yeah i'll, I'll read that in a second uncle herb <laughs> um bond finds like a fellow spy dead 
And then he gets on his motorcycle and starts chasing somebody. And it's like playing jazzy, upbeat, happy musical. He's chasing her on the motorcycle. And it's the worst motorcycle chase of all time. This movie manages to have a rocket-powered motorcycle that can do really, like, high jumps. But somehow it's, I don't know, it's probably more entertaining watching from Justin to Kelly than watching this. But yeah, Uncle Herb pointed out a comment by Oleander Rainbow. Never say never again. Making P deadly minus making a rap about it. Oh, dear. Uh, was that was that a jab at Orkilly? Oh, sure. no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny because it's still relevant. <laughs> our, our, oh yeah, James Bond versus R. Kelly. I feel like you could make a James Bond or an Austin Powers bad guy after uh, after after R. Kelly. Uh, Austin Powers versus Gold Shower. Oh my God, <laughs> Mr. Bond, I, I fight for my life, and a and a. I want to piss on you. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, or, no, because you know, they already had gold members, so it would have to be the man with the golden shower. That's what it would be called. Ah. <laughs> well, I mean, hey. Oleander saying, yes, yes, it was a jab. Yes, it, 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 thank you. Very tasteful. Very tasteful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so th- this movie is, is just is really bizarre. And let's talk about one of the other bizarre things that really caught your attention. Rowan Atkinson, Mr. Bean himself, is in a James Bond movie. So what are your thoughts, Uncle Herb? Well, obviously uh, I am a, of a, a younger generation okay. uh, than, you, uh, than you, Max. No jab there intended. But uh, <laughs> I, I grew up with actual Mr. Bean, so that's what I... I did too. And I was like, I was like, hmm. I've never seen any of his serious act. I think the major movie I've seen him in was the movie Rat Race. Do you ever see that yes, movie? Yes, I have. He's the guy who's Mr. an optic. Mr. Bean. Yes. And oh my goodness... So seeing him in this movie, like, kind of struck, like, I was kind of, like, starstruck. I was like, really? But yet again, that's the thing with actors, especially yeah. you grew up on. You you, you got to understand, you're going to see him someplace else. Yeah. It's like, I remember seeing Kurt Russell for the first time in Gunsmoke, and he was a child. Right, yeah. And that threw me for a loop. Well, yeah, he was in Disney movies, too. He's the computer with tennis shoes. That'll throw you off. Oh, my movie. God. Shorts hurt it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't remember that one off the top of my head. But, um, so, so yeah, it, it threw you out of context seeing Rowan Atkinson in this. Well, him and Sean Connery, but, I mean, they're, they're both from the UK, so yeah. it's, well, Scotland in the UK, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They're, 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 they're owned or leased out, or which, I, oh, boy, that may have been offensive. Sorry about that. But, um, yeah, the, 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 the UK has dominion over them. But, yeah, if, 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 he wasn't playing the Mr. Bean type of character. He's playing kind of a hapless bureaucrat who is trying to help Bond out. He kind of works for the British version of the Department of State. And he just kind of shows up to give him information, kind of the way Bond would get a briefing from um, when Bond goes to the Bahamas to let him know about Emilio Largo being down there and kind of running the show. And that's one of the things that's like ridiculous about this movie, too. So Largo is the number two inspector right below Blofeld. And Largo, like they have a computer showing his profile. He says, worth $200 billion. And then that goes, correction, $245 million. And I'm like... It's fucking. Con- I, I, I mean, I know that Microsoft products suck. I mean, like, yeah, that, no, it, it, but it's it, it's like who made that computer? Did he, Hewlett Packard make that computer? It's like it's like oh yes, he's worth two billion. Oh no, two hundred forty-five billion. Is he like having the Trump Organization doing his valuation? No, it's like, just computer. fluctuating and changing. It's like yeah, yeah. Largo <laughs> invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> he was mining before the mining was even thought of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, but it's so weird just seeing the computer say correction. It's almost it's, it makes it feel cheap. It's like why would they put that in a movie? We have this super computer that will give you a profile. Oh wait, sorry, I got the net worth wrong. Well, it was such a weird thing. The devil's in the details. The devil's in the details. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, no. So getting back to uh, Senior Mister Bean. Yeah. Um, no, uh, the character dynamic, the way they had it set up, kind of kind of, kind of made me think of. Um, uh, have you seen Van Helsing? Yeah. Yeah. So his 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 little understudy, the the friar, play. Uh, yeah. I can't remember the, the man's name. Uh, the yeah, actor. It's been a few years for me. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, the you know the um, how do I explain it? You know the I wouldn't say goofy sidekick, but yeah. Uh, the comic relief to the comedy of cringe. Does, uh, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. That I, that he had actually a really. It it was a funny role that he played constantly. Right. And even though he was he had a not a major part but a, a minute. Mm-hmm. detail in the movie you know he 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 was there and it and it kind of just 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 happened that was like probably yeah. one of the most organic things to just kind of melt into this movie <laughs> yeah it's yeah he, he's kind of meant there to be there to the comic relief but that's the thing is roman atkinson is i've seen his stand up 
and his stand-up is very funny and very witty compared to, you know, Mr. Bean is witty in its own way. It's like, you know, smart people can do lowbrow humor, but he's not properly utilized. It's just, he seems out of context, like it's not his sort of humor to do. It would be like if you saw George Carlin doing prop comedy with whoopee cushions. It's just really, really weird. It's, it's yeah, it's it's like taking Carrot Top out of his uh, his element and making him actually do you know comedy. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that, that that that's great. Just on a tangent, that reminds me of an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. You know, how it stars Larry David as a picture yes. version of himself. His in laws are staying with him, and his dad is like. Have you ever heard about that Carrot Top guy? I, I I think he's really funny after like just blowing him off when they're talking about Seinfeld. He couldn't care about Seinfeld, but he wants to know if Larry like knows Carrot Top or has watched him. It's, that is so a poor Carrot Top. But either way, we're here to talk about James Bond. I don't want to. I, I pulled us into Carrot Top a little too far. Um, but yeah, that that's really weird. And one of the other things that's weird about this movie is all the outfits that Connery wears. Like he's wearing a brown suit in the Bahamas. I it, I don't think brown suits generally are a good thing to wear. I know that Reagan wore one, so did Obama, and it just doesn't look good. It reminds you of a certain piece of uh, bodily. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, I told you whenever he, they were in Nassau, the, you yeah. know Nassau Islands out down in Bahamas, I, I told you he 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 gave off that really really like overly bad Hemingway vibe. Yeah, and I was like. <laughs> Did you know they were friends? You know that's like, that's, that's it just kind of pops in your head when you see that brown suit. Oh God, yeah. And then mm. there's a part where Connery is wearing nothing but jean overalls. Like I don't know who thought that was a good idea. What did you think about that? I was insulted as a man from the south. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, yeah, that was that's awkward. And then there, when he's even when he's in the fitness club, he's wearing this like full gray sweatsuit. It's like. I can't picture James Bond in, like, a gray sweatsuit. And that just goes to this movie in general. This movie has a very, very, very cheap feel to it. Even all the... Most of the sets seem incredibly cheap, wouldn't you say so? I would say for the most part, uh, the first... I'd say the first four sets they had, like, major sets, Mm -hmm. were actually pretty good. So around the 26, 27 mark in the movie, you know, the time... It's when, it, it's when it goes away. <sighs> yeah, I, I like how they're at MI6, and it just looks like they borrowed somebody's office for the afternoon, oh, like yeah. some accounting firm, and they have all the computers there and Bonds using the computer. And they also, yeah, they have the Spectre meeting, and like it starts out really cool in the Spectre meeting when Fatima Blush is going through the whole thing, but then it looks like they just, you know, rented out a library conference room for the afternoon. They're all sitting on chairs. There's no table. It looks like they rent. It's like they could have at least made it look cool by having a table, but they have all these people in chairs facing Blofeld, and Blofeld is in person, and he's just sitting there on the chair, face on a single chair facing them while they're all kind of in rows facing him like they're like soldiers or something waiting in formation or sitting in formation. And it sounds like you have something you want to say. No, I'm, I'm just. It, it's. It seems more of like a uh, a. Uh, homeowners association gathering <laughs> it does but there but there's no uh there's no spinach dip or anything like that they're they're just yeah. getting told that they're gonna you know this is what's happening and uh there's nothing you're gonna do about it you know yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that like low is like was like somebody's uh grass was half an inch over regulation we will be punishing them it has that kind of vibe about it you're right and one of the things that's ridiculous about this movie too is Whenever you see somebody on a monitor or television screen communicating, oh. it looks like, you know, like how in 60s TV shows, like they would obviously have the cutout piece and it wouldn't even look like they were on a TV. It would be like really cheap because, you know, you didn't have the budget for that back then. I guess they didn't in this movie either. So whenever somebody is like on a computer screen talking to somebody, it's very, very obviously like contrasted very differently with the lighting and everything. And it looks like it's like a cutout piece in the set, wouldn't you say so? It was very stiff. That's that's yeah. that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> very stiff. Yeah, it was a very very yeah, it was very very weird. But if, if you ever like saw like an episode of the '60s Batman when they watch something on TV and it looks really awkward, a lot of scene that happens almost every time somebody's on a television screen in this movie. And I, I do. There is one scene that I do really like and we wanted to talk about is so it's like when with Fatima Blush when she kind of gets the upper hand on Bond and is holding him up at gunpoint and she's threatening to shoot him and he's he's like oh yes you hate men and then she like aims a gun at his crotch and she's like guess where you get the first one and then he it's so random and out of nowhere and he tricks he, he tricks her into like 
trying to give let him make a signed confession it, it, it doesn't make sense and he he, he, he you know he, he, yeah. he had, or a signed statement saying that she was the greatest love of his life and right before he writes it he's like he's like well i actually can't write that you were the best love of my life there was this one girl in philadelphia <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things about this movie that, that that's so interesting is, I mean, Connery is just on point with all the jokes and humor, wouldn't you say so? Yes, and um, you you said you said it best earlier. He's like that that was that was the most subtle bit of trash tossed into a distinguished gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> his, his trash. Right, yes. Right, like like James Bond. It's like James Bond. I, when he says it, you just picture James Bond. He's, you know, maybe his car broke down in Philly and like, you know, there's some girl at a bar and he's like, oh, yes, well, we'll go home and we'll talk about the flyers. And then they go to the hotel, they have a romp and he's like, oh, yes, that was the best love of my life. The thing that I like is how he kills her. So when he, she, she's like trying to get him to sign a confession that she's the best love of his life. And it doesn't make any sense why she's this master assassin who gets the upper hand on Bond and she wants him to write down on a piece of paper that he was, the, it's like a, almost like a news, it's almost like they ripped a page out of the phone book too when she's having him sign it. I know it's as ridiculous as it sounds, anybody who's listening. I like how Bond, it, it, like, takes out the fountain pen and then he fires it at her and it hits her in the stomach because it's a Q-branch device that's supposed to explode, but it doesn't do anything. She's laughing. Oh, but the then it, the, 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 it, it's a prototype and then it blows up and there's nothing left but her high heels. Yeah, the high heels <laughs> just sitting in the rubble. Ah, uh, the good old Union Jack pen. <laughs> I was like, when I saw him hand him the pen, I was like, that is the biggest, that make the girth on this pen. <laughs> it, it, it was a huge pen. It was as bad as my wrist, man. It was, it was big. Yeah, this is like a movie where people like just didn't care or something like that. But it has a weird jazzy soundtrack through it, like I said. It's really all over the place. There's also, I would say, um, yeah, I guess Kim Basinger is kind of, I hate to, I'm not insulting her, but she plays, uh, she plays Dom, Domino, and that's the sister of the Air Force officer, and she's obviously, you know, dating Largo, but my god, it's like, I, I have like no chemistry between her and Conrad, but of course she falls in love with him. I mean, did she fall in love in just about every movie within like five minutes of meeting the the main in, you know character? Actually, that's right. That is every Kim Basinger movie. I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, we was watching the uh, uh, last night, and uh, she got slapped across the face, and I said, "Man, Michael Keaton's not going to approve of this." <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, the, the movie is so weird because one of the things that's weird is like. Obviously, her brother, the Air Force officer, is killed, and Bond is, you know, doing his investigation, which gets dragged out, and it's boring, by the way. Don't watch this movie. And unless you're really, really curious about a bad movie, this is probably the worst James Bond movie ever. One of the, not one of the worst movies ever, but it's pretty bad. I could see MST3K making fun of it. Could you? There's a reason why the director wanted to do it at least one more time. <laughs> yeah, I'll get to that towards the end of the show, yeah. And... I, I love it when Bond is like dancing with her in the ballroom and everything like that and he's, he's, he's like talking just so he can have opp opportunity to talk with her and he's like he's like your brother is dead well everybody's watching the two of them dance in a ballroom floor I'm like you're really taking a risk there Bond that she's not going to have a breakdown and run off crying and let's talk about the video game scene so you know Bond James Bond has always had like really cool card games against the bad guys or gambling interactions this is a video uh James Bond movie where Bond plays a video game against the bad guy for a charity at a casino. Is is like you know you know you know about like 4D chess, correct? The different play yeah. well, you know the game or yeah. what it looks like at least. Yes. Well this is like eight dimensional battleship that's <laughs> going on here. Like you don't I don't know what's going I on. I couldn't either. No they didn't know what was going on. They just grabbed joysticks, and that was the weird part about this. Yeah, so just picture Sean Connery across this long, beautiful table from this other guy, and there's kind of a clear TV between the both of them, and they're both shooting polygons from lasers coming out of their joysticks towards the screen, and the game is called World Domination. We're not sure how to tell if anybody's winning or losing. And there's a lot of Atari games, in, 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 too, in the casino. There's a the part where Bond introduces himself. He's like, yes, I'm James Bond, or Bond, James Bond. And then you hear all of, like, the Atari noises behind him. It's Yeah, there's like there, there was not an actual slot machine in that casino, it was it was all like arcade style games, 
Yeah, maybe Atari. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing is that this and E.T. are what killed Atari. Mm. Yeah, that nobody wanted to play Atari games after they saw them and never say never again. <laughs> Somebody's got to play Dig Dug somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that at least E.T. has redeeming value. I guess this does too, that it's fun to like poke, poke, poke jokes at it. But I, what's even more awkward is Bond gets taken captive by Largo and Largo just like lets Bond wander around his yacht. And, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't, didn't get that. Yeah, he's, he's kind of walking around and then he dances with Domino in her dance studio and kisses her, which causes Largo to freak out. And then Bond obviously sneaks off while, while Largo is in the midst of his freak out and just starts fucking up his plan to ransom off nukes. And... Then, like, they fight each other underwater, and, you know, they fight, they, well, they fight each other in this, uh, you know, Middle Eastern castle. That's actually one of the few sets that's good in the movie. But then they're fighting underwater again, and Bond is just kind of wrestling with this guy underwater and crashes his jet ski into him. And then Kim Basinger shoots him with a harpoon, and it's really underwhelming. That scene is done at the end of Thunderball. It's done so much better. With, with It's not underwater. It's Bond fighting Largo on a boat while the boat is going at a really high speed. And it, they're trying to both grab the wheel and make it not crash into rocks while they're brawling with each other. But instead they just have like two middle-aged guys wrestling in the water. And then it's kind of like watching like that fight. I think that fight scene from Grumpy Old Men was better. I, I will tell you a, a way better fight scene. Go it's ahead. when Peter versus the chicken. Yes, Peter guy. versus the chicken. <laughs> Peter versus the chicken is better than a lot of fight scenes in its defense. Yeah, but I, I'm just you know spitballing here. That's <laughs> where it got its uh, its um, inspiration from is James Bond fight scenes, and you know this probably. Yeah, that makes sense. I never <clears throat> thought of it that way. But yeah, the guy just like screws up his own plans for world domination. He tricks Bond into going onto his boat, and then Bond just kind of like is allowed to do whatever he wants and wanders around. It's actually worse than the Austin Powers thing where. He's like, oh, yes, we're going to feed them to sharks with lasers on them. Dead. you're just going to leave them alone? Yes, I'm going to play uh, Gas that goes all according to plan. This character is stupider than the average Bond villain. He's, he doesn't even have, like, some trap to kill Bond. He has him captured, and he's like, like, oh. Nah, he's, he, he's here. Yeah, and he's, like, giving, <laughs> like, I know that Dr. No gives him the tour in the first James Bond, so you have that trope where the villain is such an ego case that he has to tell Bond what he's up to. But this is worse. He's like, Oh, yeah, just enjoy the show. Help yourself. You know, there's a vending machine down the hall, Bond. If you need a dry martini, that's open on deck bar. three. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there, there, there's a dry martini. There's an open bar on deck two. And we're going to have a really good laser show later on after we blow up that site. So don't you forget about that. This movie, yeah, this movie is just fucking awful. Oh, I, I think I think we also left out another key part. Go, go for it. Uh, you, you remember the, uh, the remote-controlled, uh, completely 100% anatomically correct sharks? Oh, oh, the shirt. Yeah, tell, go on. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, like, they were, he, uh, uh, was oh, it the little magnet on his tank was he, controlling all the sharks to come towards him? Oh, yeah, that, there's a part where Fatima blushes underwater with him, and she puts this device on him that makes all the sharks start homing in on him and trying to trying to kill him. And I was like, why didn't she just, like, stab him in the gut? Or, I mean, that's a pretty cool device if you think about it, but it's like, couldn't she have just, like, you know, she's a spy who's on his level for the bad guys. Why didn't she, like, maybe, like, sneak a little explosive on him and then swim away and blow him up and said she Bond yeah. like is chased by sharks and goes through an abandoned ship and you know gets away and it's just like she knows who james bond is by reputation too that's how this whole thing gets kicked off because she recognizes bond in the health clinic but it just you think she would take more caution like if you ran into your like enemy from is a military man you met your opposite number so to speak who is on your level would you, like, maybe hit him with a wiffle ball, or would you drop a bomb on him? Well, and I'm going to give you a two-parter. Okay. Um, you got to think of it this way. I, go I, ahead, Uncle Herb. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can see where she would go to use sharks to yeah. to kill one of the most highly trained uh, adversaries she could go up against. Yeah. And, you know, just if if it was to pull off, which obviously she, she yeah. knew there was some, some, some hints that yeah. she he, he might survive. Um, can you imagine telling all your friends at the the Legion of Doom over here? I killed James Bond. <laughs> why, why are you saying it with Scottish action? Because I did it with sharks. <laughs> <laughs> that's anyways. But no, uh, yeah, no. That that's 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 the point. That's why she did it. At least in my eyes. 
Yeah, all like bragging rights. Yeah, that's true. I can see it. She is kind of nuts. I mean, she is trying to get James Bond to pen a love letter before she shoots him, and for no reason other than the fact he baited her into it. That's like one of the stupidest ways to get yourself killed. I I think we're slowly talking ourselves into liking this movie the more we <laughs> we talk about it. <laughs> we're we're liking it for the wrong reasons. It's like watching <laughs> Batman and Robin, you're watching it for all of the wrong reasons. The nipples. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is this is a horrible movie, and uh, it's obvious that I'll, I'll get into more of what it's how this happened. So, Ian Fleming wrote Thunderball as a movie script with Kevin McClory and one other individual. So Thunderball was a movie script to make Bond go on the big screen in 1956 before it was even a book. That didn't happen. And then Ian Fleming, Sir Ian Fleming, turned it into a novel. And, of course, Kevin McClory, who helped him develop Spectre, which includes Blofeld and Largo, and the plot for this movie, had the reaction of what the fuck. So obviously they fought it out. You'll see Kevin McClory listed as a producer on Thunderball, but he also got the rights to make remake Thunderball after 10 years and the rights to the villains such as Blofeld reverted to him. So he was able to make this movie as many times as he wanted in perpetuity. And yeah, he didn't learn his lesson the first time. And he actually, as early as 2004, because I remember that Brosnan was still James Bond, he was trying to get Timothy Dalton to return as James Bond to try and remake this movie again. It's like, even though that the Thunderball has a lot of stupid stuff and it's still a solid Bond film, I think that it's like, you know, if you... why We already made one really bad remake of Thunderball. Why are you going to make another remake of Thunderball? And I like Timothy Dalton, but he's not one of the most popular Bonds. Why would you remake Thunderball with Timothy Dalton, who doesn't have the brand recognition that Pierce Brosnan does? So, interesting fact, too, is Sony almost started their own rival Bond franchise because they own the rights to Casino Royale also, which is a James Bond movie, believe it or not, that's unofficial like this. It's a Woody Allen movie, and David Niven plays James Bond in it, and everybody else who's in the Spy Association, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but I know of it, they all take on the alias of James Bond, so the bad guys don't know who James Bond is, so it's harder to kill him. I know, it's a real, it is a really bad movie. I tried. Actually, I did try to watch some of it. It's probably the worst Woody Allen movie I've seen. He's made a lot of good movies. That wasn't one of them. It's really, it's not even beneath him. It's beneath him, even Uvi Ball. I'd well, say. I mean, if, if we're if we're splitting hairs here, yeah. I mean, we can always talk about John Connery and The Rock, where we we both know he is James. Bond. That is a that is a. <laughs> I, I like to. We I think we all like to like LARP and pretend that, or ha, have him. I don't know. It's like some sort of pseudo LARPing where we pretend he's James Bond. <laughs> but yeah, this movie is just a. Uh, it's a fucking travesty. I've never... I, I, I remember when I saw it, I couldn't believe it. And the thing is, like, I was reminiscing over and I was, like, saying, oh, okay, I think it's better than I thought it was. I'm like, no. Well, some things were better than I remember them being, but a lot of things were just worse. And I was like, Herb and I were watching it last night and we were like, oh, my God. We're like, I can't believe this is... We were just looking at each other and laughing. And this this movie is, like, a huge cringe fest, so... But in a good way. In a good way. <laughs> and I don't know if it was in a good way. I got kind of worn out there. No, it, it was getting boring, and then they'll do something completely asinine that would just, like, why? And you just get drawn back into it. It's, it's, if you're a glutton for punishment, this movie is perfect for you. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, I guess if you're a glutton for punishment, that's a real tagline there. But at the end of the movie, they have Connery being talked to by Mr. Bean. He's like, you'll never come back. And he's like, he's like, never again. And then he kind of winks and it's like, oh, are they setting us up for sequels? It's like, no, thank God. We, this didn't set up us up for sequels. But Sony was, Sony had the rights to this movie through McClory. And they also had the rights to Casino Royale. And they were planning on trying to make their own rival James Bond movie franchise. Because they own the rights to those two stories with Bond in it. And MGM saw the writing on the wall, to borrow a phrase from that really bad Sam Smith song. They, yeah, Herb's giggling. Um, they they bought they bought back the rights to this from the the McClory mistake, McClory estate and and Sony. So it's very good. I I mean I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of the Craig era, but I could imagine you know, if you had McClory and company at the helm, or even like the people they were associated with making more James Bond movies, we'd get some pretty, pretty bad James Bond movies, which is exactly what we got in this film. But. Um, yeah, I think uh, let's go, let's end the the the, the show on a positive note. Let's talk about a better movie that we weren't planning on reviewing. The Rock, 
So, <laughs> well, just, we got one more part to talk about. What's the other movie? part you want to talk about that we haven't even talked acknowledged yet? I think about that. I'm I mean, we're kinda... drinking wine last night because I think I blocked out some blots. What's the okay. other part you want to talk so, about? Okay, so so we actually talked about it, but like we left it out because we were just talking about it. While okay, we were... go ahead. Um, whenever his stuntman was actually like in this movie, by the way, they're actually fighting real sharks, like yeah, hurting, and I'm pretty sure killing. Them. Oh yeah, they're yes. hurting sharks. I don't think they were killing them, but yeah, they. they they were, yeah. There's a lot of animal abuse in this and movie. By the, the way, the movie warning about no animals. Yeah, yeah, like he was telling me. Oh yeah, there's a part where they're being chased by very racist character, <laughs> the, the, the very racist stereotypes of Arabs who are trying to sell uh, Kim Basinger into slavery. So Connery rescues her. It was the Arabs from Taken. Okay, that the, they were Armenians, but go ahead. Nah, Armenians are locked. Or no, they were Albanians. I thought are Albanians. Lib- uh, no, they were they were Persian. Or Persians. Persians aren't the same thing. Yeah, so no. You've been to the Middle East. You should know it's this. Actually, they're all the same to me. Okay. <laughs> I'm just joshing. Yeah, I know you are. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, Oleander, ja- Oleander says, Never seen ever again is the Bond equivalent of Batman and Robin. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty close. We just don't have anybody making ice puns in this movie. That's really just what would push it over the edge, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's got enough cringe in it, Oleander. But, yeah, there's a part, you know, Herb is talking about the abuse of the sharks. I may not have picked up on it as well. well I mean, it's that, the horses, and all the other animals in the movie. Right, so as they're being chased by the Ar- by the, the stere- racist stereotypes of Arabs, Bond is on a horse, and he jumps off the edge of this castle with him and Kim Basinger on it. And there's a really bad rear projected shot where they're up close, and, like, they're all dark, and, like, he has this weird lens flare. Like, it looks like it's from another movie. And then you see Bond and Kim Basinger's stunt double like, going into the water, and this poor fucking horse is getting thrown into the water with them and crash lands in the water. On its back. Yes. I, so this movie, another piece of movie of history. You ever see that disclaimer that no animals were harmed in the production of this movie? This movie beat the shit out of animals. And is the reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we got that disclaimer. This movie was so... this Yeah, this movie actually is worse than Batman and Robin. So this is animal... This movie very actively abuses animals. So it abuses the audience. It's like, no, that's not good enough to abuse humans. We're also going to abuse animals. I'm pretty sure that they would have run over Blofeld's cat if they felt like there was a need for it. Yeah, but hey, to end, the, end that on a positive note, there is something good that came of this movie. Sean Connery wasn't that, you know, rapey. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Sean Connery only does one sexual assault in this movie. Yeah, and it, it, it wasn't even a sexual assault. He was pretending to be a masseuse and copping a feel on Kim Basinger. He, like, got her buttocks in his hands. Or they were in love before. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so it's like it's like Sean Connery's character is less uh, likely in this movie to end up being arrested by the Special Victims Unit mm-hmm. than any other Bond movie you've ever seen. So that's a positive. But on a more positive note, if you want to see... What I, you can pretend it's a James Bond movie. Go watch The Rock from 1996. It's a buddy cop movie of sorts with Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery, and they have to break into Alcatraz to fight terrorists who've taken it over. Uh, domestic terrorists. You, uh, you gotta make sure that's put in there. They're domestic terrorists. I, actually, they're supposed to be Marines. But well, they they be they're Marines and they became terrorists. Terrorist Marines. I mean, I don't know. Oh, I'm Marine. sorry. I don't know the whole military thing. I, I, you do I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know any Marine that isn't a terrorist, you know? <laughs> I apologize. He's trying to get me in trouble. No, I'm not. Look, we all know this country was founded by terrorists for terror. I'm joking. I'm joking. Jesus Christ. I didn't realize I was having redneck Bin Laden on my show. I uh, I do fall worship the son of uh, Abraham. So, <laughs> no, I'm t- <laughs> All right, I'm done. Okay, I'm well, done. You're, 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 done. You, there's been one more guest that's more cringeworthy than you. So, but, uh, no, I won't say their name, but people know who I'm talking about. They're not going to be back anytime soon. Um, I'll tell you who that is off the air. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I would... Um, the geez, Rock. The Rock. Yeah, we were talking so, about The Rock. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so we were talking about The Rock before you went like full white nationalist on us there. I was, I was thinking more Midwest uh, extremist. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Um, okay. So, yeah, this was started out as a James Bond review, everybody. Just remember that. And so the plot is that Sean Connery's character is this British SAS operative who's been held captive by the United States. He's very James Bondy without being James Bond. If you want to see a good old man Bond thing, if you want to pretend it's James Bond, I feel like you're right. That could have, It's like a spiritual James Bond movie a little bit. 
Was I was actually reading, uh, mm-hmm. and it's crazy because you know how I am about my conspiracy theories. Yes, but uh, actually, I was reading into the, these fan theories or conspiracy theories that that's actually what they were implying, but they could never get the rights to yeah. actually uh, to actually make. As a matter of fact, I think Sony actually made. Yeah, I think Sony actually made this movie. They did. Not... Yeah, it's a Jerry Bruckheimer film, so okay, I think yeah. he was working for Sony. So then, yeah. they couldn't procure the rights to uh, actually make it a James Bond movie, but yeah. it, like you said, it's supposed to be a spiritual successor. So that's yeah. that's why I absolutely love The Rock. I mean, even though there is a lot of cringe in it, but it's oh, yeah. But Nicholas Cage is like it's one of those things. Is he's doing cringe in the way you can get away with it. I like the part where Nicholas Cage is like, you know, he's a big music fan, and that Marine surrounding him with the knife. He's like, oh, I'm gonna cut you open. It's I think it's Tony Todd from Candyman. He's like, I'm gonna cut you open, and, and then and then he aims the rocket. And he's like, you like music? Huh? I'm Doctor Stanley Goodspeed. Do you like Elton John? He's like, I don't go for soft shit. Like that's what Tony Todd says, and he's like, well, that's too bad. Have you ever heard of Rocket Man? Because that's when he fires the rocket in the like, guy's stomach. Like, what do you mean? He says, oh, you'll find out. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 and that, then you see Tony Todd get hit in the stomach with a missile, and he somehow survives if it lands on a fence and gets impaled. <laughs> so the Rocket, if you want to see Sean Connery in a good movie where he's playing a James Bond type of character, The Rock is great. I mean, so I love some of his lines. One of my favorite lines in it is like where Nicolas Cage is like, I'll do my best. And then he's like, he's like, he's like, Winners complain. Oh, say they'll do their best. The losers say they'll do their best. Winners go home and fuck the prom queen. <laughs> <laughs> they always have to be. We're, this is a Bond episode. We're gonna have to do. Yeah, Tony Todd. I'm gonna read a comment from Oleander. Tony Todd's voice is freaking auditory eye candy. It really is. And oh yeah, and then you know Nicholas Kid goes. Carla was the prom queen. I I, can't, I don't know if I can do Nicholas Cage, but he. One of my other favorite Connery lines is like when he's in the interrogation room and he breaks the window open. He sees his old nemesis from the FBI from like 30 years ago is responsible for him being locked away in a oh, black yeah. site. And the he, quarter, he uses the quarter he, to yeah, cut it open. Yeah. And, and he goes, well, Mark, I should have known. You piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way he says that is so brilliant. When he's looking like Gandalf the Grey. Yeah. Do you know, like, that was the, like, if I ever pictured... Sean Connery being old with long wizardly hair, and it was perfectly yeah. straight too. Yeah. That's that's exactly how it would look. Yeah, I love that. Too. That 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 is such a good movie. He's so good at. He's like so. He spent like thirty years in prison, like reading philosophy books. I like the part when he's against goes up against Ed Harris, and Ed Harris says the tree the tree of liberty must be refreshed with the blood of patriots from time to time, or something like that. And then he's, he's like, Oscar Wilde said that patriotism is a virtue of the vicious. And then he like clocks, <laughs> he like elbows Sean Connery in the upper vertebrae. He's like, thank you for proving my point. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not the first, I mean, uh, yeah, no, that is the first movie they actually appeared together in. Ed Harris and Connery? And Nicolas Cage. Because yeah. in, uh, I think it was a few, I think it was, yeah, mid 2000s, late 2000s, uh, they did National Treasure 2, Book of Secrets. Oh yeah, well, Connery was he's retired. At no, that not, point. not oh Ed Harris. Yeah, Ed Harris, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, he he was the main antagonist in that. Because yeah. I forget usually about actors that play together, but they'll also do movies throughout their careers. Anyways, I'm I'm no, no, chasing rabbits right now. Oh no, that's fine. <laughs> We're at that point. We've said as much as we can say about this movie. Let's have some fun talking about something that's not awful. One other thing that's not awful. If you like James Bond, there's a very good remake of From Russia with Love. There's a video game remake, and Sean Connery actually. Gave a lot of props to the video game things because he would retire from acting. He had a really bad experience doing the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. And he called it. He said that movies were getting terrible and he was tired of it. And he was done at that point. So Connery did his own voice work for the video game of From Russia with Love. Obviously, it's like old Connery. But they asked him about it, why he did a video game. And he, he basically expressed his love for the video game medium. And, uh, oh no, we're still talking, Taylor. We're, we're, we're still talking. We're talking about the Taylor is Right House Productions. He just showed up. So we're talking about the From Russia with Love video game. Sean Connery was really just impressed with, I think, how video games were evolving as a storytelling form. And he said he thought they were the future, and that's why he did it. I think that's kind of cool if you think about it. I don't think it's exactly accurate because I don't think they'll ever be the same as movies. But you think about video games like Metal Gear Solid. I was actually just thinking about that whenever he's he's talking on the on the radio and, and she's like, uh, the they got these things coming out called video games and they said one day that it's it's basically a movie that you watch but you get to control the outcome. Right. And so I I, I get what you're saying and I'm glad we think alike because yeah. as soon as you said that my mind went straight to Metal Gear. 
Yeah, and <clears throat> Sean Connery, did, Sean Connery did a really good one that came out a year or two earlier. Is Everything or Nothing, and it acts as a follow up to Die Another Day. They had Pierce Brosnan, John Cleese, Judy Dench all like scan their faces and they did their own voice acting and it has an original bond theme and you guess who the main villain is of everything or nothing have you ever played it uncle Herb? I, I i have not the main villain is willem dafoe you're kidding me willem dafoe his name is nikolai diablo and <laughs> you find out that he's a protege of max zorin and like they bring it up they're, they're like oh yes he's a protege of max zorin and then pierce brosnan in that voice i'll do a bad breath he's like he's like oh yes i remember max zorin we played bridge he lost he goes, well, you know, I'm something of a of a evil bad guy myself. <laughs> that that is a really good game. It's I think it's actually the best James Bond game, Everything or Nothing. Not that you shouldn't check out from Russia with Love. It it uses the same game engine as Everything or Nothing, but those are two really solid ones. It was so cool and it's so sad because it was like a behind the scenes thing. I think Calvin Dyson pointed it out on his thing. They do like a DVD features where they interview all the people and John Cleese is like, oh yes, we're not doing a movie this year, so we're doing a video game instead until we get to we get to the movie. And it's like, oh John, you didn't know. You, you poor guy, you. Yeah, it was, it, you know, it was too bad that Brosnan didn't get to do one more. I know that some people have been talking about him doing one more. If they could do something like this but not have it be awful as Brosnan. Not, no, no, I don't want to see Pierce Brosnan walking around in overalls like Connery do. No, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong, I was, I was getting, when, when Brosnan was uh, was in, I mean, he was my favorite James Bond when I was a child. Yeah. And then, you know, I actually grew up a little bit and yeah. actually watched some real James Bond films. Yeah. And, um. And I was actually starting to get burned out as a child just watching him continue to play. And then when they started, you know, uh, who was it? It was Daniel Craig yeah. they brought in. I was like, this is all right. All right. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see here. And, uh, yeah, then I started watching some of the old TV uh, show clippets. And I'm like, where has this been at my entire life? <laughs> uh, courtesy of Spike TV. Uh, oh, yeah, Spike TV is great oh, when God. they played the Bond marathons at yes. Thanksgiving. Oh, those were a staple. That's how I learned all of them. I'd only really seen Goldeneye, and I'd never seen any of the other ones, and I think I saw Tomorrow Never Dies and Dr. No, but Spike TV during those Thanksgiving and Christmas marathons got me right up to speed. And I want to read a few comments. Oleander Rainbow says, Connery at least respects video games as a storytelling medium, unlike Ebert. I think Ebert did a little bit of an about face towards the end of his life, but Ebert was way too dismissive early on. I think he didn't really understand how much work goes into the cinematic things. It won't be exactly the same, obviously, as a movie, but if you look at the work that Kojima puts into his video games, even just the introduction of Metal Gear Solid 3 when he's in that plane going into, I think it's called Serene, Alaska, or whatever that Russian jungle territory was, it really builds up the tension as good as it possibly can for, like, it feels like a really high-end 90s action movie. Right House Productions' Taylor, that's his name, is saying, Connery was right, games definitely have the capability... And some really do meet the standards. Okay, yeah, that's a fair point. I think that the movies are more of a passive experience than an active experience. But yeah, there are people who edit movies down to Taylor's point a little bit. To video games down, excuse me, to point where you can watch them as movies. There have been plenty of times where I've watched Metal Gear Solid. Um, well, just watch, not, not even the playthroughs, just watch the cutscenes edited together with the boss fights. They, there is the capacity. I think they were, would work better as made for TV movies or miniseries, would you say, if you had to adapt them? I think that video game movies. I, oh, I, w I would say, like, not not even a miniseries. I mean, no, I'd say a miniseries, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally a miniseries. Or, yeah. Uh, what, like, uh, I guess it was a miniseries, uh, Tenacious D, like, whenever they had their little uh, miniseries I haven't seen on that HBO. One. Yeah. Oh, oh, never mind. Well, yeah, you but I get your point. Yeah, yeah. But, but no, I, I have to think about like shows such as Stranger Things or a show. Cult, uh, like uh, the snippets like we were talking about earlier, the little mini series or the mini movies for the Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad mini yeah. Movie. yeah, but I, I, yeah, I'm saying with the how much people are investing in TV. You know, I don't think TV is the same as cinema, but I think it's close because you have different directors from episode to episode, stuff like that. It's not. It's meant for a home audience. It's not trying to take advantage of the sound features of a theater and the big screen. But I think that if there has to be an on-screen thing, the best screen possible is television because video games have nine hours of story. And that's why games such as Max Payne don't turn out so good because Max Payne has, my gosh, 12 hours maybe of story or maybe even six hours of story. But that's too much to turn into a movie. And that's how we ended up with the film that we got. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Oh, Mark. Well, I, well, Mark Wahlberg didn't write that. But that movie could have... Couldn't you see Max Payne working better if it had... If it was done by the, let's say that you gave the people who did 24 um, the ability to turn Max Jesus Payne into Christ. one season. 
you could see that working, couldn't you? Give or take, yeah. But a good, like a good action TV show series. So you take your pick, but people are competent at doing that. Yeah. Hello, Devin. Good to see you. And um, I also want to see what Oleander said. Bioshock and Hotline Miami, they don't have their deep plots, but I do like their stories. Yeah, I think there's a lot of growth. growth, And I do think that Connery was really on to something. And I, the man the man was a genius. I mean, he has a lot more range. He That's part of the trouble he got into, I think, with his career. Is he is very talented. He started out doing Shakespeare on the stage as well, if I'm remembering correctly. And... I, one of my favorite roles of his is his Dr. Henry Jones Sr. in The Last Crusade. Because that is the opposite of James Bond, wouldn't you say, Herb? No. Really? Because I think he's like wimpy. He's not... He hates violence. No, you gotta, you gotta understand that from his point of view, though. Or you gotta at least think like he would. Uh, you got a son that is a raider of tombs and all things intricate... And you're just, you, we all know Sean Connery was a badass, okay? He yeah. was, he was. No, I'm just talking about Dr. Henry Jones. Yeah, I know, oh. but he's an overprotective father at oh, this okay. point because that's his only child, Junior. Oh, maybe. Think about it, yeah. Well, he, no, he seems angry because Indy is laughing when he's killing Nazis and blowing them up. He just seems to look at him in disapproval because I remember when he shoots all the Nazis, he's like, look at what you did. Or, or whenever, uh, the, what was her name, um, in the movie, uh, Elsa. Yeah, Elsa. She's like, Indy. He's like, Indiana. She goes, yes, Indiana Jones. He goes, he starts laughing. He goes, what? He goes, that was the dog's name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he says that to Sala. That's who he says it to. Yeah. And Sala starts laughing. He's like, you were named after the dog. And he, yes, John yes, Rice yes. Davies is actually going to be in the new indie movie. I don't know if it'll be good or not. But... Yeah, to be honest, I, I wonder I wonder if they're going to have Shia LaBeouf in it. Uh, I don't know. He's because seen, that is. That would be like having Ezra Miller in a movie. It's not a good idea. Hint, hint. I mean, you got to think it's canon now. He's he's canon. Yeah, he's canon, but you know, maybe you know, maybe he's off. Like, in a, you know, it's the new indie movie's going to take place in the seventies. Maybe he's doing drugs somewhere. I think that Shia LaBeouf is just the, the character Mutt could come back, but not as Shia LaBeouf. He's in Shia LaBeouf. There, there. I won't get into it on the show. He has his own problems that are really public. So that's why I think they. Don't. Oh, him becoming Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. That's exactly what I, you know. You know better. You know what I was talking. about. Or, or the about. wieners on or, uh, his picture of his wiener on the internet. I, I mean, that's, you, the, that's the least of it. The, the yeah. wieners on the internet, the cowboy. They go hand head. in hand, and you know. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> no, there, there, there's some abu- allegations from his former lover, which I won't get into because. Um, this isn't the time and place. We're talking about Bond here, though. <laughs> yeah, but, but but no, the thing is, like, I, I like him because, I, th- in my opinion, Dr. Henry Jones Sr. is a very different character than Sean Connery's portrayal of James Bond. And that was something Michael Caine even said about him, that Sean Connery is a much more talented actor than just playing that character. He does, he does have a very, very wide range, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so, too. He, he he does have a wide range. I remember one of my favorite Sean Connery lines. Like, it's so corny, but remember that movie Entrapment? Hmm. The one where Catherine Zena Jones is going through, like, the lasers and is sticking her butt up in the air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you're yeah. heterosexual. You remember that. There we go. But, um, yeah, I, I love it when he, like, it, it, it turns to the year 2000, he grabs Catherine Zena Jones, he kisses her, and he's like, Happy millennium. I'm just a little, I'm just a little upset still right now, because, uh, I like the lasers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it wasn't the butt that you remember. It's the no, lasers. No. Okay, I, I'm sorry to, to misrepresent your views. Um, I, I, I want to see some more things. Uh, Dev looks like she's also looking forward to the new Indiana Jones. And it says, I get what you're saying. It's a similar reason why I refuse to watch the uh, film adaptation of The Rum Diary. Okay, yep, yeah, I get it. And um, what was it? Yeah, but... Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of really good stuff out there, Sean Connery. I mean, Entrapment is kind of not one of those late 90s blockbuster cheese movies, but that's even good. Um, I, I am looking forward. To, I, I do wish Connery was well enough to be in the fourth Indiana Jones movie. I'm sure if he was in better health, he would have been, but he was retired, and I think he was fed up with movie making, and honestly, he probably had the right instincts, even if he was in the fourth I, I think one. I think he was actually, he already knew that he, he was he was passing from cancer, so... I, I think that was he, he was uh, he's already he knew what was happening. Oh, even in 08, he I, he had it. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. oh, geez, that's well, he was struggling a long time with it. That's terrible. Uh, but yeah, the the man was a giant, and he has done a lot of a lot of really good work. So, um, even in the Hunt for Red October, the one thing I like about Sean Connery, I'm not the first, is it's something that people hate about him. People hate that he never changes his accent. I love that Sean Connery doesn't change his accent and he gets away with it. 
he plays an Irish cop with a Scottish accent in The Untouchables. And um, the other one that I like is, like, in The Hunt for Red October, everybody's trying to do English accents when they're Russian. He's like, yes, I'm Russian. Yes, yes, we're, we're going to get rid of the, the Red October. You know, he's, he's, I, I can't remember any lines of the Red October, but I like that everybody else is kind of maybe trying to make it sound like they're Russian speaking with English accents. He's like, yes, I'm completely Russian. I'm actually from Lithuania. Or something like that. I know Lithuania yeah, isn't Russian. But I went to school in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So th- there's a whole body of work. You've heard us talk about them. This movie is only good if you want something to get drunk with a friend, which we did last night and laugh at. So if you want a James Bond that's movie that's terrible, if you have friends that like MST3K, Mystery Science Series 3000, like to rip on movies, this is worth watching. Just to, It's good and funny for the first 30 minutes, which I'll give it credit for, but after that it becomes terrible. But its redeeming factor is you can get through it with alcohol and you can get through it with a friend making fun of it and laughing and talking about how cringe it was last night. But I think that's all I have to say about the movie and Sean Connery in general. Do you have anything else you want to say? Uh, yeah, uh, I would like uh, I would like honestly to say that uh, Sean Connery, like you said, was a giant, mm-hmm. and I honestly don't know anyone that could feel or even remotely get out of his shadow. Um, you know, and he was probably the only good part of this movie. Yeah, and and not only was he the 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 main character, the comedy, and just. The action of the movie, yes, yeah, some of it was fucking. It was just just terrible. Amazing outfits, minus the brown suit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Although those are the jeans and when he's in his underwear, that was okay by you. The overalls, yeah. Well, no, that, the overalls, that's, 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 that 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 doesn't count. Okay. <laughs> that's, okay. that's not a wardrobe. That that's okay. like wearing socks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm from the south. Okay. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, man, that's uh, that's all I gotta say. I, I'd say on a scale from one to ten, I would rate this movie a hard four point. One. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it was a delight having you on, man. I, I'm really glad we finally got you on the show. Um, it's been a pleasure. You know your shit, and I hope to have you on again. Um, I look forward to it, man. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thank you for showing up, and thank you for listening on replay. If you like absolutely bizarre movie reviews like this, don't forget to hit that. Su- oh, there we go. Screwed it up. That subscribe button. There we go. Don't All right. Have a good like day. the video. Don't forget. <laughs> Oh no, I wouldn't. I don't endorse liking anything with ever uh, saying ever again. What are you a game streamer? <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. Bye bye.